Right. Um, before I begin, Professor Nash, uh, I would like to reiterate that it's a great honor and pleasure to meet uh, one of the greatest mathematicians and economists of our time, and even more so of a privilege to have one of our questions answered by you. So, as Andy said, sometimes we may come up with ideas or theories that disprove conventional wisdom or go against society's norms. For example, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. So what is the best way to project an idea that may be against traditional thinking? Do you have any suggestions for such controversial work? Uh, yes, well, I'm not sure this is like a, a, a game of, of personal strategy. Darwin is an interesting example. You know, uh, Darwin might have not have published or might have published much later if it hadn't been for this other person, Wallace, who had also traveled around the world in ships, British Navy or British ships, and observed how animals would be different in different parts of the world, or animals are planned, so that you, you see different forms developing in, in, in different areas. <coughs> and this is what led Darwin to the idea of the, uh, the basic ideas in evolution. Uh, a different form can evolve in one area, area than would evolve in another area. And uh, Wallace made a publication first, a relatively short publication. See, this goes against the basic picture presented in, uh, when you really look at uh, Evolution broadly considered, and it, all the, and it goes against the basic idea that in the, the Christian Bible or in the Jewish Bible that God created the earth and everything in seven days and created in a certain pattern that could be preserved in, the, in Noah's Ark. Now, Noah would have a, a lot more to put in the Ark he had to put the local variations of every species, like, like in the, just in those, uh, those islands of Ecuador, what's the name? Galapagos Island. Well, you, you go to a different island, you find a different variety of finch, the bird. So Noah's Ark would have to have all those different varieties, if you look at it straightforwardly. So it, 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 did, it did lead to some complications, and Darwin didn't publish until Wallace had published. Uh, I think this is interesting in relation to how such ideas develop. Um, so, Professor, so, Professor Nash, um, has this ever happened to you, where you have had some controversial idea which you try to publish? Well, I have sort of a controversial idea now in relation to money, and I, I have published something, and I'm, I, I have thinking of another publication. I have been discouraged to 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 some extent about publishing in a certain journal. But as, as essentially, the idea is that the governments, governments are, are, are producing a, a, a sort of a system of money that is, is not really as good as it, as it might be, but uh, people are being uh, taught to think that it is better that the money is just printed in a matter of the convenience, well, which when it, it can be become a matter of the convenience of the government, rather than that the, the money is maintained with any standard value or the purpose of, like, if there were something like a gold standard, or if it were related just to silver in some definite way. That's, 
you notice the history of money, there have been, there have been metals, so gold and silver go back to the earliest, earliest history of any sort of coinage of money. Right, thank you, Professor Nash, for your insight. Now, does any of the audience members have any questions? Right, the gentleman in the middle over there. Um, well, sir, um, what is your opinion on the euro and Greece, and what, what do you think should happen to the euro and whether Greece should remain or leave? This isn't something that's cooking right now from day to day. Is the issue whether or not Greece has a referendum about these policies. My, uh, my own sort of variant opinion is that perhaps the, the, the Greeks didn't really need to borrow any money at all, but they, they needed some, rather something like an emergency government. And then they, they could really economize, really cut down on the expenses. Uh, some of the, if they borrow money, uh, much of it goes to pay for the, the, the salaries of government employees. And, and uh, if those are replaced by army officers, military people, then they only need to pay for the salaries of the military, which could be a considerable economy, and uh, so I, 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 don't, I don't know this. It, you, it's not not clear how, if things went on some way when when the process would stop, when when they would have borrowed enough money, and how they would pay it back. Is it supposed to be paid back? Of course, another complication is some of the money, some of the indebtedness of the Greek government is now not supposed to be paid back. And the, the people who would owe, be owed that money, some of them would be maybe Greek citizens who have some extra money who bought the government bonds. Or uh, others, European banks, that for some reason bought the, the Greek government bond. And these, these, these creditors are supposed expected to take what has been called a haircut, which means they get only part of what they were supposed to get. And initially the haircut was described as a small fraction of what they really owed, but more recently it's described as 50 percent. So it's, it's a rather confused situation for the observer. And I don't really claim to understand it, but I, I can observe it. Thank you very much, Professor Nash, for your answer. Um, and now I'd like to ask a question that popped up in my mind when I read your biography. Um, as we all know, most scholars tend to develop existing ideas and follow the paths laid by past researchers. But um, when I read your biography, I discovered that, by contrast, you often come up with some revolutionary ideas um, and you approach problems from a completely new perspective that nobody has ever thought of. And it seems that you are not keen on taking courses, but instead like to think on your own and make your own discoveries. So do you think learning too much about existing results would actually hinder a student's creativity and innovation? And what do you think is the best way for us to learn? Well, one thing is simple, I'm saying learning too much Definitely, I think would have that effect. But there's a, most students would learn only a, a small fraction of what they might well properly learn. Like in mathematics, it's really like there's an infinity you can learn if you if you learn like you could you could learn the to know the content of every published paper in mathematics. Uh, some of these could be sort of very side results that are, are a little obscure. They, you can have a, a very good mathematical contribution. However, it's a side result. It could be 
some little proposition in geometry that is not known of. I know one thing in geometry that a person could know, but sort of mostly for a cultural reason. There's a way of drawing lines inside a, a triangle, any triangle, and you, you form a, a, a figure that, that's inside of that. I guess that's a triangle also. But this inner triangle has an area that is one seventh of that of the original triangle. And this, this is not so easy to prove. It's a, it's a, it's a significant theorem, but it's, it's also a little obscure. Like, I, I don't see why a, a, a mathematician would not need to, be, need to know that unless it would consider it standard so that it could be asked on an exam or something. But there are, there are many, many nice discoveries of mathematics that are around in corners. And I, I don't think someone should be expected to know them all. Oh, thank you very much for your answer. Um, I think um, you have inspired us to study um, as broadly present results as possible because there are, uh, there are so much out there for us to absorb um, and this will certainly be helpful for us um, to establish new results on our own. Um, now perhaps we can pass the time again to the audience. Uh, there have been various arguments to say that mathematics is something in our minds that doesn't actually exist. For example, we can't point out any Euclidean shape in this room at all. None of it is actually there's no rectangle. The walls is not actually a rectangle. There are grooves in it. So, and there have been other arguments that says that say people, you know, the Fibonacci sequence, the golden ratio, it's everywhere in nature. So I was wondering if mathematics and numbers actually existed, or if it was something that we cre that humans created in our heads. Okay. So the gentleman is asking whether mathematics is um, an only an abstract concept that exists in our mind, or does it really? Um, exist in the world, in reality, all around us? This, this, this is a basic philosophical question that, that comes up uh, often. Quickly. In, the, in the world, humans, we really live in the world after the story of the Tower of the Babel. The Tower of Babel in the Judeo-Christian Bible tradition, that was like something uh, made in, in Babylon, the area of the late Saddam Hussein, and uh, everyone was speaking the same language, but then they, they, they wanted to build a tower to reach to heaven, and God didn't think that this was such a good idea, and so through confusion into the, the workers, so they spoke different languages. And then they no longer cooperated well on building the tower. So, <laughs> but the, the result was, of course, the, all these different languages and cultures in the world. So mathematics, however, we, nowadays we see that as something, certainly the, the basic numbers, which are called usually Arabic numerals, although they originated in India, they're considered to be standard. And, uh, and the, the, the theorems of mathematics are considered to be standard. And uh, much of the notation is standard. So uh, have we, have we got, gotten beyond uh, the arbitrariness of human ideas and descriptions, are, 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 are we still in the area of human arbitrariness where we might have a, a description only according to some specific language rather than a universal description that would be independent of national languages? Well, we can't, we can't really be sure of that. We, 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 we know that mathematics functions as an international language of certain types of communication, 
I would like to describe it as the language of precise and quantitative communication plus also logical communication relating to the, the first aspect of it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nash. Um, I also have a question regarding theories. Um, so as we all know, Professor Nash, you are known for great theories within the fields of mathematics and economics. But is there a source of motivation that drives you on? What is behind the passion that pushes you on in search for answers of your questions? Well, I, I really can't answer that question. That question. This this goes to the level of psychology, and and I cannot claim to have a perfect psychology, though I'm not in, entirely bad in psychology. Uh, I've had I've had some ups and downs. So, why does anyone want to work any more than a minimal amount, or why do we want to, to do anything that, that, that might be valuable for what, what, what any reason? It's a, well, it's, if you think about it scientifically, you, you see, you could take your Darwinian view, but well, of course, humans are involved to work. They, are, are, they exist in an environment they must work in order to support such numbers that there are. Then you bring back the Bible, the, the Garden of Eden, it was not necessary to work. But what was the situation there? Well, it was uh, maybe near the area of the Tower of, the Tower of Babel, and it, with the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, there, well, there was a, a tree. <laughs> there was a tree of of life and, and and a tree of knowledge. And if Adam and Eve, who were the entire human population, could restrict themselves to the, to the tree of life, they could live happily, happily ever ever after. Happily ever after, they could just live on that. But. As it happened, they perhaps inevitably were tempted and went to the tree of knowledge. And then they were multiplying, and then they had to work also. So, and they were expelled from the garden. Well, it's just the sort of thing. We, we, have, we exist in such large numbers that we have to work. We couldn't just be, be uh, in Tahiti uh, living on fruits from coconut and palm tree and other trees, fruit trees, without without doing any work except to, to pick the fruit. And we have to do industrial work in addition to agricultural work to prepare for the agricultural machines and technology and and other things to take care of all the people who are who are not producing food to do, and to do medical care so that we live longer, and so on and so forth. Thank you, Professor Nash. So I suppose it's instinctive for us to progress through uh, with, with ever-growing ever technology and theories. Now, does any of the audience members have a question? Well, in the economics, people are assumed to be selfish and um, they will try to maximize the gain in everything that they do. So um, when you study economics, so how does studying economics change the way in which you view humans and human relationships in general? And do you believe that altruism exists? Did you mention altruism? Yes, uh, I think the lady didn't mention. Yes, well, there's, there's sort of a paradox I mean, there's a conflict here. Economics has been called the dismal science, and I think that is not unjustified. That's the thing where the situation in Europe and Greece is about 
doing some things about debt. Well, it's not good to be in debt, but maybe economics can tell you something about handle, handling, handling so that it's not worse. But that is, that is where you're working with dismal science, because it's a dismal situation when there's only indebtedness to be concerned with rather than, than credits and lots of reserves and excess of money so that you wonder how to give it away. Um, so, uh, but does, does this, does this, uh, well, economics was, besides from just a bad situation, economics can perhaps help towards efficiency. And uh, I, I may have lost part of the question, but there is what's called econometrics. And the, the latest Nobel, the Nobel Prize Award in economics actually was awarded to two persons who were at the time at Princeton University, although one of them is a visiting professor from New York University. Princeton University is where I've been, although I'm not in the economics department. I have a different location, but um, one of those persons is very much an e econometrics student. And this is where economics becomes its most scientific. You measure things and you see how, how things relate. You can study the evolution trends over time. So it can be more or less scientific. <laughs>